Now we may invite uh, another respondent, and uh, she is uh, Professor uh, Minakshi Thapan. So, Minakshi Thapan. Huh? Huh? Next, no? Yes. She will be responding to the paper presented by Swami, Dr. Atmapriyanandji Maharaj. I'd first of all uh, like to thank Professor Geshe Nawang Samtanla and the organizers of this conference for inviting me in the presence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. I feel enormously privileged and I must share with you that I'm neither a philosopher uh, in any tradition nor am I a scientist. I'm actually a student of sociology, of human beings in interaction, in social life, and I will seek to understand the theme of Swamiji's talk from this perspective, uh, taking into consideration insights uh, from the work of the radical thinker, Sri J. Krishnamurti. Uh, Swamiji, uh, your talk on uh, meditative awareness as right vision is a metaphysical construction of the transcendent and what human beings are capable of. Or to put it different, what are the transcendental cap capabilities of an individual's inherent nature? You showed us very lucidly how Vedanta and Buddhism point to this through themes of the awakening of consciousness, continuous awareness, or right mindfulness, insight, and so on. At the same time, a bridge between the transcendental and the social world needs to be articulated and negotiated, and you referred to this when you talked about dharma uh, as an element of sustainability, holding things together. In other words, we need to bring the transcendent into ordinary everyday life. Or as the anthropologist Veena Das puts it, we need to descend into the ordinary, not seeking or aspiring only to be a higher being, a better being or a more virtuous person, but in the here and now, in the tumultuous reality that constitutes our everyday life. As you indicated, Swamiji, society is in chaos and we need to take the reflective turn in the midst of the devastation around us. Uh, so how do we do this? I really liked your idea of the mind curling back on itself hmm, that offers us a way out of the impasse of what we may call understanding and control. That is, we, this impasse exists when we seek to control the mind through excessive effort at reigning in our thoughts, especially those we consider bad in a normative sense, and simultaneously we seek to express or focus on our good thoughts. This necessarily results in conflict. So your idea of Samyak Darshan actually helps us to understand that the mind is a flowing and fluid entity. It is this mind in flow that we observe in order to attain that state. However, this mind is not independent of society. We are not independent individual beings, but live in and through relationship. We are engaged with society, therefore, and relationship to society shares or shapes our perception of mind. Krishnamurti uses the metaphor of the tide going in and out. To quote him, it is an obvious fact that we as human beings living on this earth have created the society and the society then controls us, shapes us. It is like a tide going in and out. It is this constant reaction between us as separate human beings and the society in which we live. So how do we then understand this relationship between the inner and the outer? The constant flow from my inner world into social existence with all its anxieties, dilemmas, conflicts that shape my own perceptions, views, ideas, values, and so on. There is a continuity to this tide that is flowing in uh, and out and back again. So how do we then make sense of this flow which constitutes the mind? Is introspection the answer to understanding the mind? Perhaps we need to pose the question, what is the relationship between self-knowledge, introspection, and meditative awareness? 
We may think that through introspection, a process of inner exploration, we may gain an understanding of our mind. Uh, what, however, do we mean by introspection? Krishnamurti says introspection is a process in which there is no release because it's a process of transforming what is into something which it is not. So in a sense, it's a false process of understanding oneself. He argues that introspection is actually an accumulative process in which there is an attempt to understand what one is or a thought in connection with something else. Uh, not really in necessarily how one really is. So there can be conflict, division, uh, created out of this aspiration for an ideal and discovering oneself as one really is. Is, as he points out, is introspection then um, an attempt merely at self-improvement? And this is actually, we may say, a kind of self-centeredness and accumulative process. So then what is awareness? Uh, as you talked so much about meditative awareness, uh, we, may, uh, we may say that in awareness there is observation without condemnation, without denial or acceptance, and that awareness begins with outward things, being aware, being in contact with objects, with nature. Uh, first, there is awareness of things about one, being sensitive to objects, to nature, then to people, which means relationship, and then there is awareness of ideas. I, I'm quoting Krishnamurti, this awareness, being uh, sensitive, etc., to people, nature, ideas, is not made up of separate processes, but is actually one single unitary process. He says, it is a constant observation of everything, of every thought and feeling and action as they arise within oneself. As awareness is not, condemn uh, it's not condemnation, so in that sense, there is no accumulation. And uh, you only condemn when you have a standard, which means that there is a constant effort to improve the self. So awareness is actually to understand the activities of the self, the I, its relationship with people, with ideas. That awareness is from moment to moment, and therefore, in a sense, it cannot be practiced. When you practice a thing, it becomes a habit, and awareness is not a habit. A mind that is habitual is insensitive. A mind that is functioning within the groove of a particular action is dull, unpliable, whereas awareness actually demands constant pliability and alertness. Uh, this, to my mind, uh, constitutes the crux of Krishnamurti's teaching on awareness, that it cannot be practiced and therefore must not form a habit. It if, uh, if it acquires this character, it becomes another aspirational thought. That is, seeking to perfect oneself and reflect on the mind, the practice of awareness will actually dull the mind and result in mere repetitious actions, reducing such a practice to a form of aspirational behavior. Uh, and it is essential to be rid of the observer. I think some of this was talked about in the morning. Uh, so awareness, in a sense, is a state in which there is no justification or identification. Therefore, there is understanding of the state of passive alert awareness where there is neither the experiencer nor the experienced. And it is in this uh, way that Krishnamurti actually concludes that introspection will not give one access to the state of mind that is only through self-awareness. And I think that this is the vipassana or insight that Swamiji talks about th this morning. Uh, I would like to just briefly bef conclude now by saying that awareness also shows us the nature of the trap and therefore the negation of all traps. So the mind is actually now empty. It is empty of the me, to quote Krishnamurti, and of the trap. The mind has a different quality, a different dimension of awareness, this awareness is not aware that it is aware. Uh, I'd really like to stop there, but I think I must add that Krishnamurti leaves this entire process in the hands of the practitioner. There is no external entity, whether a guru, teacher, drug, 
or anything else that can teach us this awareness. It's individual effort alone. And uh, could we therefore understand this awareness or attention as a form of continuous meditative awareness in everyday life? Uh, perhaps I'd like you to respond to that. Is it possible? We need certainly to pay attention to this form of self-awareness and self or self-knowledge, as you yourself pointed out, focusing on the here and now of my everyday existence in a very complex reality filled with all the travails that visit us as we negotiate almost a hundred years later, uh, Yeats' poetic cry, Swamiji quoted the poet Yeats, about the nature of the world and strive towards what he asks us to do, the global citizen in the contemporary society. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Minakshi ji. The ultimate aim of uh, Vedanta, Yoga, Buddhism, and for that matter, all systems of uh, philosophical thought is to have refinement and widening of our consciousness mm -hmm. so that uh, the I is transformed into we. And uh, this transformation is not just theoretical, mm -hmm. it should also be translated into actual life. And that's why we do take help of uh, meditative awareness, which is a means, most uh, efficacious uh, means. And uh, there is some sort of commonality among all the three systems, it seems to me. So, so we thank you for your uh, response. Now, Swamiji, would you like to respond? <laughs> Let me begin a lighter note. Just now she was saying that she is neither a scientist nor a philosopher, but a, a social... Uh, sociologist. Person of sociology. So I was remembering an interesting joke, just to keep people awake. <laughs> Post-lunch session is very difficult for a speaker. The only task is to keep people awake, not in the Buddhistic sense of wakefulness, just ordinary wakefulness. The chemical engineering was a field which was <coughs> Uh, which came into existence several decades ago. And uh, I remember the introduction to a book called Chemical Engineering by Coulson and Richardson. It begins by saying the following, who is a chemical engineer? A chemical engineer is one who talks chemistry in the presence of an engineer, engineering in the presence of a chemist, and politics in the presence of both. <laughs> so in that sense, no, we... We are neither specialists in anything. So I used to be a physicist once upon a time. I'm neither a physicist nor a philosopher, but it's my robes that lands me into such seminars. So. <laughs> now, a beautiful quote from Jay Krishnamurti that ultimately she says that he leaves it in the hands of practitioners when there is no practice at all. <laughs> So the two points, one is the mind has an extraordinary capacity to transcend itself. This is the fundamental note on religious experiences. I will also talk in terms of experiences because talking philosophy without relevance to everyday changes which take place in our own lives, transformative experiences doesn't have any meaning. The mind keeps on thinking about an object and at some particular point, the mind has the capacity to transcend its own sphere. The self-transcendence is a fundamental quality which is endowed to the mind for whatever reason. And the whole problem is the relationship between the absolute, the transcendental, and the relative, which is empirical, which is ordinary. This was raised just now. How does the transcendental inform our daily life? If our daily life, the mind is only empirical, non-transcendental, just concerned with what happens in space and time, the idea of the infinite or the idea of transcendent would not have 
occurred in the mind at all. Just because the mind is able to think about something which is transcendent, it naturally follows there is a capacity to intuit the transcendence in some way without which it could not have spoken about it. So the mind actually works in two spheres at the same time. This is just, I'm not talking philosophy, it's just an ordinary perception. On the one hand, it is finite. Excuse me, the AI cast. The eternal, eternal problem. It appears to be finite from ordinary experience. It is small, it is limited. It can only see certain things. But it has the capacity also to think of the infinite. Which means, as Vivekananda points out, everything in the universe has two dimensions. <coughs> One of the dimension in which it is infinite, the other dimension it is a finite. As Rabindranath Tagore will beautifully put it, it is the infinite as it were, which is peeping through the window of the finite. He calls it Asim and Sasim. Mm. Uh, you should be able to quote that. Uh, the, from the Asim, which is infinite, the, 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 the limitless, is actually peeping through the finite. Shankaracharya, in his famous Bhashya and the Ken Upanishad, there's a famous verse, Prati Bodha Viditam Matam Amritatvam Hivindate. There he says, Prati Bodha Viditam Matam means Bodham, Bodham, Prati, Viditam. That means every one of the uh, cognitions which you have, the sensations which you have of the mind, the eternal actually is being experienced. In and through the eternal, in and through the infinite, in and through the Atman, you are experiencing everything. And therefore, what could be the relationship between the absolute and the relative? By definition, absolute is something which is beyond time and space, which is just now pointed out and therefore of causation. That which is desha kala nimitta atita, beyond space, time and causation, is what we call transcendental. And that which is not transcendental is obviously conditioned by space, time and causation. Can then be in relationship at all? Dear Krishnamurti, one of the lectures I've heard, he says there can't be a relationship. How can the inf transcendent be related, absolute be related to the relative? He says, the only relationship, if at all it can have, is through love, through compassion. Mm -hmm. I thought about it very seriously and discovered that even in ordinary love, worldly love, there is an element of non-causality. Because in the, when he talks about no practice at all, mm -hmm. awareness cannot be cultivated Awareness cannot be practiced because practice involves space-time causation. That means whatever you do as a sadhana, as a practice, which is conditioned by space-time and causation, cannot lead you to something which is transcendent or absolute. Because sadhana or practice is in space-time causation, that which you want to achieve, the absolute is beyond it. Therefore, Krishnamurti will say, that if you achieve something through practice now, through the practice of awareness, practice of meditation, or practice of whatever, then you are projecting what you are going to achieve from the present, and therefore it will be necessarily conditioned by the space-time causality. Now, what is the way out? So Advaita has no answer to this. Advaita, what is the, suppose somebody, what is the practice in Advaita? As Krishnamurti says, there is no practice at all. If there is no practice, how do you remember, realize that you are Brahman, you are the infinite? The answer is, you remove, the practice is removal of the ignorance that you are not Brahman. So the, there are two streams in Vedanta, for example. You begin by saying, who am I? Who is the I? Koham. One stream says, in the Jnana path, it is Soham. I am that infinite consciousness which is Brahman. And the bhakti path, I am Naham. I reduce myself to a non-entity, to Shunya. And the Shunya and Purna, Shunya of the Buddhism, Nagarjuna's Buddhism, and the Purna of Shankara Vedanta are identical. This can be mathematically proved. In fact, Swami Ramakrishnananda, one of the illustrious disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, gave a simple example. Simple trigonometry. Shall I mention this? 
school trigonometry, all of you know the four quadrants. And you know sine, cos, and tan, all of them are positive in the first quadrant. And sine is positive in the second quadrant. Tan is positive in the third quadrant. And cosine is positive in the fourth quadrant. Now when you keep increasing the angle, when you exactly reach 90 degrees or pi by 2, tan is infinite. Tan pi by 2 is infinite. When you infinitesimally increase it, tan becomes negative. To be able to move from infinite to negative, it must have passed through zero, which proves zero and infinity are the same. Why I mention this is because one is you reduce your ego to a non-entity so that the ego simply becomes empty, what Krishnamurti called the emptiness of the mind. Then you become Purna. The approaches of Purna and Shunya, the Bhakti and Jnana, they merge there. Now, the meditative awareness which is being spoken about in Buddhism and uh, Vipassana, etc., which has been referred to, that is a practice in which awareness remains without specific focus. This has been discussed in the Mandika Upanishad, which has been referred to Professor Vandabhadhyay. In the waking state, your awareness outwardly focused. I am talking to you. I am looking at you. My entire awareness called Pragya is focused outward, called Bahish Pragya. When I am dreaming, my entire focus of awareness is Antaf Pragya, inwardly focused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am coming, friend. And if it is a totally non-focused as in deep sleep, it is Pragyana Ghana, it is without any focus. Now, can you simulate that unfocused awareness in the waking state? This comes very close to what Mahesh Yogi used to talk about as transcendental meditation. One great Swami told us, it simply is simulating sleep while you are awake. Which means, is it possible for you, while being fully awake in the waking state and going about all your actions, to remain in a state of awareness in which awareness doesn't get particularly focused? How do you practice this? The Bhagavad Gita says, it is the prakriti which is functioning. Prakriti kriyamana ni gunek karmani sarvashaha. The mind and the body and the antakarana and the senses, they are all, let them do what they do. You remain as a constant, non-participating awareness or a witness. The Shakshi Chaitanya, which Vedanta talks about. So this is one easy way in which, you, as you said, going about your daily life, now and then you remember that you can cut yourself off. A simple example which comes to me, when I am talking to you, I am seeing myself in that screen. But I am talking to you, I project myself in the screen looking at you. Can you do that? You go about all your actions, but constantly project yourself in the screen and look at you. I'll give a simple example and finish. Premier shows are usually showed to the actors. There was an act in a tragic film. The hero performs so extraordinarily well. Show is being... Uh, show, uh, the premier show is being enacted there. He is sitting there and sipping his lazy tea and saying, ha, ah, he is weeping in the screen. Ha, ah, that wonderful weeping which I did. This is the best thing which I wept. Can you do that? When you are full of sorrow, when you are full of joy, can you say, ah, I was so full of sorrow, the excellent sorrow I had. Which means, when you are sorry, sorrowful, you don't identify yourself with that sorrow. When you are joyful, you don't identify with that joy, but remain as a non-participating witness of your sorrow, mm -hmm. of all your emotions. I am not particularly talking about the witness consciousness of the Vedanta. Can you remain as an unfocused consciousness, allowing all these emotions to come and go like a stream? Mm -hmm. They simply come and go. The Buddhist meditation, the Vipassana meditation, for example, Everything is a constant flow. Everything is constant change, flux. Everything is anitya. Allow this function flow to happen. You remain as an unfocused consciousness 
neither outward focused nor inward focused. Consciousness is a very interesting uh, phenomenon. In dreams, consciousness itself has the capacity to divide itself into a subject and an object. So much discussion of subject and object. In dream, what do we do? I create a subject, I am the object myself. That means both of them emanate from consciousness and both of them therefore go back to consciousness. Can you remain as the con identifying yourself with unfocused awareness consciousness without getting broken up into subject object? This is possible to practice. So we thank uh, Pujya Swamiji and also Professor Minakshi ji. And uh, time is up now. So we may now invite uh, the next uh, respondent, and uh, that is Dr.